article Euro Disneyland, there were a variety of topics discussed. First, about a year after opening day, there were financial struggles within Disney, Euro Disneyland. However, executives, including Michael Eisner, who was the CEO at the time, remained optimistic. When designing Euro Disneyland, Disney wanted to use a cookie cutter business model that was used for Tokyo Disneyland. I personally think that they wanted to just follow the same business model just because Tokyo Disneyland was successful and they wanted Euro Disneyland to be just as successful. There was more focus on the economical side of things instead of social values. This could be one of the reasons why Euro Disneyland had many cultural conflicts in the beginning. For example, the Disney company did not serve, serve wine in their theme parks. They just didn't believe in doing that. However, in the French culture, wine is served at meals. So this was something that was not taken into consideration when designing and implementing ideas into Euro Disneyland. On April 12, 1992, Euro Disneyland opened to the public. It was estimated that half a million people would be in attendance. However, the parking lot was less than half full and 25,000 people were in attendance by lunchtime. Everyone knew that the magic was out there and it just needed to be found in Euro Disneyland. So I'm going to be discussing um, what kind of strategy Disney uses. And it's, it's definitely local when it comes to um, Euro Disney. Speaking of the case itself, it discussed a lot about um, what they had overcome in the process of building it, where they wanted to build it, um, how they were going to incorporate local strategies, local ideas. Um, so the finding local, um, Disney is a global brand, obviously. We know that. It, everyone knows about Disney. It's a household name, movies, TV shows, it's everywhere. So it's a global brand that when making parks, it adapts to the local environment, um, especially Disney and its parks, um, it definitely has to attract people to that local destination. So speaking of Euro, in the case, it said that they incorporated 60% French culture, uh, meaning castles. Um, they definitely had a competition with castles in Europe. Beautiful castles built everywhere. So they had to incorporate huge castles, beautiful lights, like in the picture. Um, it had to be spectacular. And when they did that, they also had to put 40% foreign. I think of this as American. They have to have American values in there as well. Their own values have to be in the parks themselves. So that 40% is mainly their, their traditions. It's, it's not American to a sense to where they want the American story to be told in the local strategy of French. I think that's a beautiful percentage for how they needed to make this story be told. Um, when deciding that, they had to take a step back and realize that they're not in America. Um, they had to adapt to the culture of France, of Paris. Um, people drink there uh, when they when they eat. That's something that they had to change later on in the making of the of of the park of Euro Disney was they had to realize that people were not happy with it. And so they definitely changed. I'm not saying that it was a perfect park out from the beginning, which it definitely was not. Um, but they adapted correctly. And it's a beautiful park today. And I think it's a wonderful percentage for what to incorporate in a, in, in a park. And then the next one is uh, the theme park culture at Disney. Um, I focused on all of them. Uh, definitely can be put on any of them. But um, when they train their employees, they train them with optimism, innovation, decency, quality, community, and storytelling. Um, for their um, differences, they had to change a lot of uh, a lot of rides for their storytelling to combat the culture of Paris, of French, of of Europe. Um, all the all the people in the culture at each park has different rides, merchandising, holiday celebrations, and visitor traditions. Um, America traditions are completely different from Europe. They have different values. They have different views. Um, merchandising is going to be completely different. What kids love in America is not what kids love in Europe. They have to adapt to that. They have to change their own culture. Um, and that percentage of 60 and 40, I think Euro Disney did a fantastic job of changing the outfits of Mickey, of doing different holiday celebrations. They don't want all the parks to be the same. Uh, that's just poor poor marketing, um, not speaking of culture. 
Um, so incorporating culture is a fantastic way to make each park amazing in its own way. And embracing the celebration of local culture is another way. Um, traditions, events, uh, we don't celebrate the same things that they do. They don't celebrate the same things that we do. Uh, one thing that they were afraid of was making the parks too similar and people wouldn't want to travel to the other parks, which is not the case at all. Um, the case talked about how uh, they were afraid of people not wanting to come over to America when Euro Disney was so great. And it was not the case at all. It's all different. It's all amazing. And it's it's just a wonderful place to be. And I think Disney incorporated amazing culture in Euro Disney with each of its employees and its customers and satisfying what the culture of Europe entails for Disney itself. Hey guys, I'll be discussing some of the ways in which Disney faced adversity while trying to enter into the foreign market, specifically the market, or excuse me, specifically the French market. Uh, first off, Disney had already entered the French, uh, French market with some of their products, such as TV shows, movies, books, and so on. However, the presence had already had a negative impact uh, on the French, and the French didn't really view it as something good. Uh, the French have a very traditional culture, and it was viewed as that Disney was here to ruin that culture and bring a lot of the American values and views into that culture. So essentially just to change up their culture. Uh, like I said, they did not like the idea of Disney importing over those American ideals and values. Once the theme park uh, had the right for construction in around 1987, about the spring of that, the French felt that not only would their culture be attacked, but also the natural landscape of uh, France. Closer to the end of the construction project, Disney opened up for job applications. And as we know from the lecture videos this week, Disney had a very strict dress and appearance code. However, in France, it was felt that that code wasn't allowing uh, French citizens to truly express themselves. So it was met with a lot of adversity there. And they did not really fully agree that a Disney employee had to follow those strict uh, guidelines and rules. Lastly, for this slide, Disney saw a, saw a smaller than usual crowd on opening day due to the media, such as radio and TV stations, warning people to stay away from the Disney park area. And this was due not only just to boycott a little bit, but also keep the, uh, the flow moving through France, as that can be a high congested area, especially with the opening parks uh, or opening of the Disney park. So what should Disney have done differently when entering into the French market? Uh, some of the biggest things that they should have done was to conduct more research on their target market and what the ideals and values were, how to design a park to cater to that, and what the French enjoyed and didn't enjoy, and the little details that needed to go into like the coloring, design, and the layout of the Disney park. Also, corporate Disney was very closed-minded and wanted to pretty much copy and paste the Disney park model and themes from like the U.S. and other countries into the, into France, thinking that it was going to work perfectly without doing that full in-depth research. And the idea of catering to the host country was a very costly mistake that was very easily overlooked that pretty much shouldn't have been. Is Disney too diversified given current technological and globalization trends? According to the United Nations, there are three megatrends related to globalization. These three trends include shifts in production and labor markets, rapid advances in technology, and climate change. I feel as though Disney has become too diversified in these three categories. First, the Disney company has become a super competitive place of employment. You have to meet certain criteria in order to work there. I understand this, of course, because they do want their characters to look a certain way so that can so that they can be relatable to their customers. For example, one of my friends looked up the requirements to be like a Cinderella princess, and you have to be within like a certain height requirement. So I just feel as though like the company is super competitive with like who they employ. But again, it is understandable because they do want their characters to look a certain way and act a certain way to make it more real realistic for their customers. Another way that Disney has become too diversified with current technological and globalization trends is the fact that Disney has become so innovative with technology. 
not just like everybody has become so innovative with technology. We use it in our everyday lives. Um, but for example, Disney has created the magic band, which is like similar to like a wristband that you wear that acts as a, tisk- a, a ticket, hotel key, credit card, and tracker all in one. I couldn't imagine keeping track if I was a parent of my children, all the hotel keys, the credit cards. So I just think it's really, like I said, innovative that they created something like that to help families have a more like organized time per se at Disney. Um, Finally, the last mega trend related to globalization includes climate change. Some examples of how Disney helps manage climate control includes renewable energy, conserving fuel, reducing waste, and protecting nature. Disney uses renewable energy via solar-powered facilities. Um, This is a quote from their Environmentally Sustainability article on their website. This facility is anticipated to generate enough power from the sun to operate two of our four theme parks in Orlando each year. The Mark Twain Riverboat in Disneyland Resort in California runs on recycled cooking oil from throughout the park. Like I said, I also feel like that ties back to like the innovative technology standpoint that Disney believes in. And so also Disney reduces waste by removing the single use plastic straws and stirs from all of their locations around the world. And finally, Disney has invested in providing invested in and provided areas for animal and local communities with resources. Overall, I do feel as though Disney has become too diversified in all three of these categories, but I wouldn't necessarily say that all of these things are bad. It's just how things are right now in 2021.